Now for the last essential idea. Economists usually explain price determination as follows. They say, let us suppose there is a demand curve. Here we measure the price, and here the quantity. It is obvious that as the price goes down, people demand more, and as the price goes up, people demand less. And here is the supply curve, which is the opposite. As the price goes up, sellers supply more. As the price goes down, they supply less. Well, economists say, the market price is determined by the intersection of the two curves. This is the market price. And they explain, if it were higher, supply would exceed demand, and therefore the price would tend to go down. And if the price were lower, demand would exceed supply, and the price would tend to go up. That is the way they explain it, and students swallow it. They all take notes and go home satisfied, thinking they have understood everything. Well, dear students, all of this is wrong. None of this explains anything. With a little critical thought, you will understand right away. What we must explain is how the market price is arrived at. Well, with this procedure, we are assuming that what we want to explain is already given. In other words, the point is already there, where the curves intersect. And when professors tell you that if the price is higher, it falls, and if it is lower, it rises, that is very easy for them to say, because what they want to explain is already there, and so they haven't really explained anything. Furthermore, the supply and demand curves do not actually exist, among other reasons, because human beings do not have in their heads the information necessary to construct them. We do not know what we are willing to buy at hypothetical prices that have nothing to do with the one we expect in reality. And what's more, the shape of these curves is irrelevant. The shape does not matter. If the curves intersect at the same point, the price will be the same. What I want to tell you is that, first, the price is a historical ratio of exchange that emerges in the genetic causal market process at the very end. Second, human beings value goods creatively. As a result of the division of labor and the law of marginal utility, we tend to place a very low value on what we have, and a high one on what others have. And third, this attracts us like a magnet to exchanges, because we entrepreneurially realize that we come out ahead if we make them, and if we become aware that in a certain situation there is equality in opposite subjective valuations, we immediately agree to an exchange in which a price is set. The price is the end point of the whole process. In contrast, here the price is presented as the starting point. That is, here the price appears as the independent variable which determines everything, and that is not the case. It is not that prices mysteriously rise and fall as if by magic, and nobody can explain why, and if they go down, we buy more, and if they go up, we buy less, it's the other way around. If we buy a lot of a good, if we have an intense desire for something, and we buy a lot of it, the last thing that happens is that the price rises. If we do not value the good, or there is a large supply of it, if we decide to supply a lot or buy little, then the price falls, the price comes last. The price is always the dependent variable, for there are no functions in economics. I have already explained it over and over again. It is a genetic causal process. Therefore, this entire mainstream theory is unsound. It is static. It constructs them. Moreover, it presupposes what it is meant to explain. The point of intersection is already there, and that is what we want to explain. Let us find it. Furthermore, these theorists commit the error of assuming that the independent variable we parametrically adapt to is the price, when what really happens is just the opposite.